Um, and in the interest of being informal, um, is there anyone who wants to kick us off by talking about some sort of cool, interesting, or other professional development event that they've been to recently? Maggie, thank you. Welcome. Also, what do you think about my center part? Yay, nay? Is this some kind of Gen, Gen Z thing? Are you trying to young up? Yeah. I think it looks good. My okay. my head doesn't do that. Um, I braided it in, in with the center part last night, and that helped like cement it. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Do yes, please do. Yep. All right. Um, so I um, attended the. Don't worry about this junk. Um, I attended the. Uh, Visual Resources Association um, annual conference two weeks ago now. And so um, the Visual Resources Association, let me just find a tab. Um, they recently changed their kind of like little sound bite. Um, uh, so it, uh, actually, so it's VRA, but it no longer stands for Visual Resources <laughs> Association. Um, they want to be VRA, the International Association of Image Media Professionals. Um, but it's, so it's a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to furthering research and education in the field of image management. So essentially they're image librarians. They used to be slide librarians. Now they are image librarians. Um, uh, and it, that also includes people that work in digital collections and like special collections and archives. Um, but it's a lot of people who run visual resource centers, um, which are usually placed in art departments um, on university campuses, uh, such as uh, we have a visual resources curator at UNCG, Teresa Transu. She works for the art department. Um, so uh, anyway, the, I um, am interested in this field because I'm interested in um, image description and also image research. So how people um, look for images and use images. Um, and so I attended a conference. Um, and there were a couple of cool um, sessions that I went to um, that um, are in, that I find relevant to my interests. And um, one of them is teaching um, how to catalog art in a non cataloging class. Um, and so uh, this slideshow, which I'll share here, um, was a uh, an LIS class um, on art documentation. Um, and so sort of like image records is one kind of art documentation, but so are like an exhibition catalog published by a museum and stuff. Um, I can't find my chat window because I'm sharing my screen. There it is. Okay, uh, so I'll put that here. Um, and so it sort of walks through, the, pr the professor had them um, catalog uh, works of public art um, going through and how they photographed them, how they measured them, um, what uh, information they got from like living artists, um, et cetera. Uh, and um, there was also um, this session where they did a text analysis project looking at the concept of visual culture in um, uh, a dissertations and abstracts database. Um, and this is actually pretty similar to something that uh, I'm working on with uh, Brown and a bunch of people who are on an ACRL task force around visual literacy. Um, and so they uh, built a data set and then they basically we're just looking at um, text frequency, trying to build a bibliography from their results. Um, and we're doing some topic modeling, but um, this is uh, interesting because they're visual resources curators. Um, and so uh, they um, are looking at this data in terms of acquiring images. Um, so they're looking at dissertations um, published in various fields uh, that contribute to research on visual culture. 
Um, and so it's helping them build a bibliography uh, and identify what kinds of images um, they might wanna add to their visual resources collection. Um, and then the one that I wanted to really share, which um, uh, this was like, there were so many people in this session. This was like one of the like sort of like uh, really exciting people are looking forward to this session. Um, uh, there is a new um, uh, OCLC um, tool. It integrates with Content DM, uh, and I know I know we just got rid of Content DM um, for many reasons, uh, but it also makes use of um, linked Wikidata. However, the part of it that um, people were really excited about was um, the image annotator tool. So, uh, so OCLC was introducing four different tools uh, as part of this pilot project. Um, so uh, retrieving um, descriptions for specific images or entities, um, uh, building an interface for searching in the linked data database po populated by uh, Wikidata, um, a field analyzer, but then the image annotator. Um, and so part of the, the issue with cataloging art images, and if you ever have looked at art store um, and tried to do searching for um, images about things. So like if you wanted to find images about love, for example, um, there's no way to search for that in an art store because there isn't any comprehensive strategy for cataloging um, aboutness in art. Uh, ofness is, you know, describing what is it an image of, you know, it's an image of a cow, um, a cow standing in a field, uh, you know, but uh, what is it about? You know, is it about uh, the ravages of war? You know, is it about et cetera? Um, and so the image annotator tool, um, they went through all of these here, uh, the various tools, but the image annotator is cool um, because uh, it, um, uh, allows you to um, distinguish between about and depicts uh, and then for different parts of the image. Um, and so you're mapping like ofness and aboutness to particular elements that you can identify. Um, and the idea would be that it would be interactive um, when you are viewing this image um, in various contexts. Uh, and so, um, this was something that people are excited about at just as a paradigm, um, you know, not necessarily just in content DM, but that this is a model that could work, um, for image cataloging, um, and searching, uh, and they were just showing sort of various like entity, uh, entries like this particular type of trumpet. Um, but anyway, so, so the Visual Resources Association, um, yeah, there's a lot there, uh, Suzanne is um, in the chat um, saying, you don't want to preempt a user's experience, uh, you know, uh, by telling someone what an image is about, you know, um, but uh, there's also the degree to which, you know, sort of like aboutness has been established by, scholars or art historians and like do you want to you know include some kind of um you know like consensus you know aboutness um to make it searchable you know so it's like you don't want to preempt somebody's experience of an image but if they can't find the image um you know based on its aboutness you know then can they experience it anyway um but yes, so the Visual Resources Association Conference, um, lots of stuff about images, images as, um, ob, you know, uh, as research objects, um, images uh, that are used in various fields. Um, and uh, there are recordings of all of the sessions on Vimeo, and it might be a private channel, 
but anyway, if you get a chance and look at the, um, if there was anything that you were interested in, I can send you the links to recordings and slide share and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that is all I have to share. Thank you so much, Maggie. Does anybody have any questions for Maggie or want to ask questions? That's the same thing. I've had too many meetings in a row. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, Thank you, Maggie. You're um, anyone else want to share? I can share something um, awesome. quickly. And I'm on my iPad, so I'm sharing from my screen is not really a thing. Apologies. Um, but I recently attended the AAU APLU Accelerating Public Access to Research Data Summit uh, that was held in March. And this brought together a bunch of people from not just libraries, but um, research offices and scholars who are involved in research data and working with research data and um, librarians and others to talk about helping people manage access to research data and trying to make research data open. And um, it might interest you all to know that a recent dean of ours was a keynote speaker of this event. Um, and uh, there were other personnel from UNCG there as well, Kim Littlefield, Emily Yankee, and others. And there were some interesting opportunities to do breakout rooms and things and talk to others who were um, broken up often by the area in which we work. So I got to talk to some other librarians. And um, also I'll say that this is not something that I chose to attend. It's something that I was sent to in a place of the data librarian that we look forward to hiring soon. Um, but one of the things that I found the most interesting at this was that some of the problems that we have and some of the challenges that we face with research data are things that we are definitely <clears throat> not alone in. Um, talking to other librarians and hearing about the, like talking about kind of the carrot versus stick analogy with trying to get people to use good practices and to consider sharing their data openly. Do you want to incentivize it by providing a carrot or do you want to like snap them on the back of the hand with a stick if they are bad? Um, I don't know what the best answer is. I, uh, many people had many thoughts and um, I look forward to us hiring a research data specialist librarian who can contribute to these discussions on our campus because we have a lot of colleagues who are interested in this um, and there's really a need in uh, helping faculty understand the specific things that go into um, sharing and using and finding uh, research data. So I am really excited for us to be hiring for that position. And yes, Jenny, interview starting next week. Thank you to you and your committee for so much work on that. This person um, that we hire will definitely, I think, have some opportunities to continue working with this uh, APARD or APARD group, Accelerating Public Access to Research Data. And I look forward to connecting them with that group. There's actually a North Carolina APARD summit that's happening later this month that I am also being sent to because um, I don't think we'll have this person in place by then. But uh, when that no. person arrives, <laughs> I will be um, eager to shift that responsibility to them. Um, Anna, I have a question for you in terms yes. of, you know, you said there were a lot of different people with different roles um, that were there when you were talking to other librarians. Um, did you get a sense of like what level of service like people were expecting of data librarians or libraries generally providing data services or people expecting like experts or they just expecting 
help with certain things? Is it just a whole range? In terms of expectations from users? Yeah, of librarians or of librarians. Okay. So uh, that's a good question. And I I don't think I can answer it very well because the the experience or the, um, the conversations that I had were more uh, with uh, people talking about their specific libraries and the services that they provide and less about what they specifically about what users are asking of them. And also it, one thing that's perhaps helpful with in terms of context, a lot of these libraries that were there were like much bigger libraries than us. We, I think were probably one of the smaller, probably not the smallest, but on the smaller side of schools that were there. I don't think that will be the case at this North Carolina summit that's coming up where I think we will probably be one of the larger schools. Um, but at this one, like it was people from Stanford and Duke and Virginia Tech and Cornell who um, have a lot of them much larger programs and much more established data services models. Um, so it was nice to know that they still face challenges, but they also have larger programs than us. So it was kind of um, apples and oranges, if you will. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns about accelerating public access to research data? Wonderful. I'm all for it. Yes, yes, I am all for it too, as long as someone else is doing that acceleration. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, thank you. Yes, Patrick, just remember we're being recorded. Um, <laughs> yes, accelerating access yes. to data services librarian. Yeah. That's what I, I'm oh. really here for. Accelerate that access to a data librarian, please. I too have been looking forward to that since 2019 when I first began sharing this committee. Um, all right, this is uh, awesome. Thank you. I have one thing that I want to share. So I'll share while I let other people just like really, you know, get their ideas percolating or whatever. Um, I recently went to um, the Georgia International Conference on Information Literacy. A couple other folks who are here, Rachel, Juanita, and Sam all went as well. Um, and I thought it was a great conference and it was also a very well run online conference from my perspective. Um, they have like a division of continuing education um, and every session had like a moderator who was from a library or, or had some sort of information literacy connection and then like a tech person. So anyway, I recommend that, especially if they continue to do that as like a, an online conference because I thought they did a great job. I've been in person as well and I also thought they did a great job there. But one of the sessions that I went to that I really liked was called um, TLDW, Too Long Don't Watch. Uh, creating information literacy instruction students will watch from start to finish. Um, so I thought this sounded interesting um, and it was. So I will share my screen and show you. Um, this, is the, this is from the University of Central Florida Libraries. Um, and these two folks were our um, presenters, uh, Renee and Christina. Um, digital Learning and Engagement Librarian and the Outreach and Engagement Librarian. Um, and they talked about how they had in the past what was called, I think, Research Tips Tuesdays originally. And it was like full 40 minute like webinar sessions, even before COVID, they did these every week. Um, and it would be, let's see if I can find some of the older ones. Um, so yeah, like 30 to 40 minute webinar sessions on things like read articles like a researcher, um, notes on note taking. It's kind of an interesting mix of like um, information literacy or library stuff and things that I would associate with like our academic and student success units on campus, note taking, time management, things like that. Um, but they did um, kind of a, a cool mix of those things. Um, but when 
things started shifting because of COVID, um, they switched things up and they did um, what they called Research Tips Thursdays. And they changed things entirely. So they moved from this sort of like synchronous plus recorded webinar that you could like go to and ask questions and then you could also watch it later to these two minute videos that they released um, every um, Thursday. And the spring 2021, obviously we're still in that, but again, you can still see it's kind of a mix. Um, so they had mostly information literacy type of stuff, um, but they had some like pretty specific topics. I've watched a bunch of these. Um, Maggie, I know is familiar with this dig method, which is a, a visual um, evaluation or image evaluation method. And they have this nice two minute little video about what that is and how you can use it and apply it. They had some cool ones about statistics. Um, so here's a time management E1, but a lot of them are about sort of things that we would associate with student research, information literacy skills. Um, yeah, that's a good point, Maggie mentioned. Maybe we could use this. I'm gonna be incorporating a bunch of these videos into my classes because two minutes is just like chef's kiss, a perfect amount of time. Um, so I was gonna actually show you one. So I'm gonna go into uh, this one, Know Your Numbers, because something else that they provide in addition to the video is additional resources. And so in this case, they have listed a couple of books from their collection um, that support the particular topic, but uh, let me make my sound work so that you can hear. Um, but I thought I would play this so you could get a sense of what they are. And this is something that I would definitely be interested in, in us thinking about um, maybe not just for research tips, but this would also be a cool way for us to sort of showcase different services, different departments, different things that we do. Um, so I was very intrigued by this, but I'll, I'll play at least part of this one. Data and statistics are one of the best ways to support an argument, but it can be tricky to know when it truly supports an argument and when it's being presented in a way that makes the data seem more relevant than it really is. Here are some things to look out for. A correlation is a single number that describes the degree of relationship between two variables. Sometimes it can be confused as the cause of something else. Here's a more humorous example from the website Spurious Correlations. Common sense tells us that although there is a clear correlation between eating cheese and bedsheet deaths, they have nothing in common. It is more difficult to argue against a correlation when it is two things that common sense tells us could be related in some way. Sometimes the raw data is correct and from a reliable source, but it's presented in a way that makes the data appear to support a particular claim when it actually doesn't. One technique is by manipulating the scale to minimize or increase the impact of the data displayed. One way to gauge the accuracy is to write a sentence describing the data. Does it still seem to have the same impact? When evaluating a statistic, be sure to pay attention to the sample size. Large studies can create a statistically significant finding based on the sheer number of people. Conversely, if a sample size is too small, it may not have studied enough people to detect a real difference or relationship. These concepts are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to evaluating and navigating the world of statistics. If you still have questions, UCF Libraries is here to help. Just ask. So that is an example um, that I liked. I, I like that it provides like, it's short, but it provides some um, like very practical tips. Um, and yeah, Patrick, you're a hundred percent right. So if, if y'all have never, um, played with the website spurious correlations. It's all that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of, of Nick Cage related, or there used to be a bunch of Nick Cage related data in there. Um, and I used to use this in class a lot, but I'm gonna see if there's, if it's still around, yes. Um, but yeah, I, there's like a bunch of really dark stuff in this. When she said that it was gonna be a humorous example, and then the example was about bedsheet death. 
I was like, oh, that's not funny to me. Um, because like Patrick said, this is now a new anxiety that I didn't realize I needed to have, but now do. Um, but yeah, you, that's right. Suzanne's right. Patrick, just go vegan and then you don't even have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, um, I really, I liked this idea a lot and I thought it, I felt like it had a lot of practical applications that could go beyond just sort of research tips. Again, it could be like, you know, know your library's Wednesdays or something like that, um, just so that you're like kind of learning more about the um, library for students or faculty or um, even as kind of a marketing tool. So that was something I wanted to share. And now I'll see who else wants to share or if anyone else wants to share. Still lots of time. Hello, I've come hey, back Rachel. inside because it was too hot and polleny. It is um, quite polleny and, and it's out by a sort of heat level today, like too much. Um, I went to the same conference and I didn't get as much out of it, but I did go to one session that was kind of nice where she was just talking about, you know, strategies for trying to teach synchronously on Zoom um, and maybe just offering some advice and feedback or not feedback, but some advice related to that. And I think probably I'm trying to find my notes. Um, I think one of the most helpful things that she said was just being okay with those awkward silences. She says that she waits at least 30 minutes between, um, you know, asking a question and assuming that there's no one who's going to answer. <laughs> and it's really That's awkward. That's so long. <laughs> it's really <laughs> awkward. Yeah, but she says it's helped her a lot. Um, and she's gotten feedback that like students might be typing or I guess collecting their thoughts. So it's, I mean, it's very uncomfortable, but I may try that approach. And then she also just sort of talks about like a couple other Zoom takeaways. Don't, um, you don't always have to share your screen. Um, thinking about like planning ahead for technical difficulties. Um, I don't know that I learned anything that was like earth shattering and great, but I, I think that's all fair. One thing she did point out, and I think we've talked about this before, but I can't remember. Um, there's this institute library active learning institute or something at dartmouth and i don't know if people have thoughts on it but it seems like kind of a neat program and i dropped the link in the chat um applications have obviously closed for this year but um i don't know if anyone has experience with it and can say whether or not it's a worthwhile thing because i would maybe be interested um not online but potentially in person so um and yeah, Suzanne, it is very difficult because there are no faces or eye contact. And there's like, I've gotten into conversations with people at work and on Twitter about like the ethics of asking people or forcing people to turn on their cameras. Um, and I will admit that, I mean, I don't think you should do it. I don't think anyone should be forced to show their face if they don't want to. Um, but, you know, I'll admit a certain sense of like, not relief, but like, it's, I don't know, it is kind of nice when students are, are willing to do that. So, or when professors, you know, say to their students, like, hey, you know, do this if you can. Um, but I also fully reserve the right myself to not turn on my camera if I don't want to. So it's just interesting. Nothing terribly, you know, life-changing out of that conference, but it was cool. Yeah, that tension that you're talking about is something that's interesting to me that I, I think about and that I sometimes talk about when I do conference presentations, which is that like for myself as a like as a teacher, I'm always like, all right, we're gonna do active learning, we're gonna get in breakout rooms, it's gonna be great, you can do some group work. Um, and then, you know, recently I was at a meeting, and part of it was just the fact that it was uh not the kind of meeting I would want to like have active learning be part of. It was like a very large group HR supervisors meeting. Um, and there was a moment where they were like, okay, but we're going to get in breakout rooms in a little bit. And I was just like, oh no, like I can't even imagine. So sometimes I feel this tension between like the way I learn and engage in sort of um, interface with the world and the way that I ask students to do it. And I'm thinking about that a lot 
in Zoom in particular, because like a lot of times I just don't want to have my camera on. I'm like really tired of looking at my face um, after a year of just looking at my face all day long. Um, but I sometimes do sort of feel that disconnect whenever I am teaching to, you know, a bunch of black boxes on the screen. And I, and I can't even get that sort of like, oh, like, even if they're like totally BSing me, they're nodding. And I know that they at least have, you know, picked up on some kind of cue to nod. Um, but that's, yeah, that's been something interesting. And I think like, like you're saying, we didn't like learn a ton of earth shattering information from this. But one of the things I liked about this conference this year was I just felt sort of comforted, like that other people were experiencing the same things that I was. Um, and I, I did, I enjoyed that. Anna, you have a hand up. I have a, a question kind of about what you were saying related to breakout rooms and perhaps some fatigue of users. Uh, and this actually was happening at the apart thing that I was talking about. There were some people that like, there were a number of breakout sessions throughout the day. There were maybe three. And there were some people that as soon as uh, the announcer or the, the leaders were like, all right, we're going to breakout rooms. These people were like out of the conference and then they would come back for the next main session. And I, I, I just wondered if that is something that people are seeing more of. Um, I certainly have been tempted to um, bolt at certain breakout sessions. Um, I don't know if that, that is something that people are becoming more comfortable with now or like that we are hitting a limit in terms of Zoom and professional development and like willingness or maybe that we all have like I am experiencing this, like often with professional development, if I was there in person, I would be engaging. But if I'm here, like I'm working and also trying to do whatever it is that I'm doing. And um, so there's that kind of like, I don't have time for this or whatever. One thing I would like, um, sorry, Jenny, were you going to say, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. You're good. Uh, well, they did these um, breakout rooms in um, these like ACR ACRL leadership things this summer, and I had no childcare, and it was like, you know, my kids were in the background, they kept coming in, and like when you're in a group of four people, and they're like trying to get you to talk, like, you know, and then you feel guilty, and then you're like constantly apologizing, you know, and I, I know like, you know, it's a different time, and we're all being flexible, but, you know, a lot of times there's, you know, I mean, in a pandemic where we've all been had to shift how we do things. It doesn't mean we're not working and we're not willing to pay attention. It's just that some people can't like really like can't um, do it or like they just don't have the energy for it. You know, I mean, you know, and that's what I think we're talking about. But I do want to say like, I think a lot of people, it's not like you're like, ugh, like I don't want to, um, like, you know, I don't like this or like, I'm not doing this. I think it's just like, you know, like I I can't, like I'm, I'm trying to be a part of this. I'm trying to listen the best I can and be here, but like, you know, there's a lot going on. I'm like pushing against the deadline while I'm at this conference, you know, kind of um, thing. Um, multitasking. Yeah. Like I was thinking about this the other day, like when we, like, you know, when we're going to have to like have in-person meetings again. I mean, think about how many people are probably like answering emails in the background. And then when they hear their name, you know, like called or whatever, they like pop it, you know. Doing and, that right now. <laughs> I mean, that's fine, that's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> like, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but like, you know, in a meeting, you can't like in person, it's, you know, different. So anyway, I just wanted to, I thought of that. When I think, when I see people bounce in breakout room sessions, I think back to my like summertime of literally, I mean, I remember like being pushed into this room with ACRL president and like my kid was climbing on me and like, you know, May was like, Hey, who are you? Who are you? You know, like in this like breakout room. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I seem like, you know, this frazzled person. But um, anyway, um, okay, sorry, that's my speech. No, uh, I, so I really appreciate that perspective. I was not thinking as much about that side of things, but you also uh, kind of reminded me of a day that I was on campus in a session sometime earlier this year. and it went to breakout rooms and tech services. There weren't that many people, but like 
it's an open office and I didn't want to have the conversation. I didn't feel like I could comfortably have the conversation that was supposed to be being had in that breakout room while I was in that open office. So I was like, I can chat via text only, but like, I can't talk right now. Um, so there are, thank you for reminding me that there are a lot of reasons that people are not able to engage with breakout rooms. And it's not always that I just don't and sometimes like it. I've done breakout rooms and like, you know, students are scrambling to like turn on back images. They're on their phone. You know, I did a consult the other day where the student was working like at their job, like on a floor in a public place. And I was like, should we reschedule? Like I'm sitting there like, no, like this is when I need to do this. This assignment is due, you know, and they were okay with doing it that way. So I just think again, technology means we have the ability to be flexible and multitask and do these things. Um, but it puts us in a lot of like different scenarios and environments than we're, you know, used to, uh, then, pre-pandemic times, you know? <laughs> um, like I imagine I would have never had a consult with a student um, working, you know, on a floor job um, in the pre-pandemic world. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting. I'm thinking about like, I use breakout rooms a ton when I'm teaching my like one-shot classes. Um, and there are usually like there end up being some like tech issues or, you know, somebody is using their phone and it's not working that well or whatever. But I feel like in a classroom setting, it's it's reasonable to expect that like you're going to get sent to a breakout room at some point if you're in a, a large class in Zoom or even if you're in a smaller class. Um, but I have started trying to warn people when I do conference presentations, like, hey, there are going to be breakout rooms towards the end just so you know, and that's something that happened actually in my presentation at this Georgia Information Literacy Conference, which was that I had um, at least like 15 people drop out whenever we went to the breakout rooms. Um, and I had like said that from the beginning and I still kind of found myself being like, oh, I'm kind of sad. We can't do the, the full cool activity that I've put together here. Um, but it is a good reminder that like, People got stuff going on and it is, um, I, I feel like maybe there's been some that hopefully many of us have, have really developed our empathy muscles um, during this year um, in different ways. I, um, I take everything personally, everything in life ever. Anyone who knows me knows how personally I take it, um, always. And that's not a good habit. I don't support that. But like, I've had to learn to get over it a little bit in some of these sessions where you do that and people leave or people, you know, don't, it's really hard, even when you're in an in-person class, not to feel like, I don't know, a little bit gross when people kind of won't play along or won't answer questions or anything like that. But um, I think over Zoom, it can even be like a little bit harder to not feel rejected. So I definitely get that. Um, even though it's not real and asking people to turn on their cameras, even asking is hella rude in my opinion. So, um, I don't know what I'm saying. I guess I get what you mean. Thank you. All right. Anyone else want to share anything cool you've been to a ULVLC session? Um, other stuff. Sam, yes. Hello. Thank you, sure. Yes. Um, I also went to the Georgia Information Literacy Conference. <laughs> I know this is the most recent, but what I wanted to talk about is kind of funny in that I went to a session about UDL, um, Universal Design for Learning and Practice, and it made me think of when I was thinking of coming to this, that like we haven't really done like a UDL session, and um, UDL is something I'm very interested in, and I think it's really useful in a lot of ways, um, of course, for instruction and design, um, but I think also like life. Um, so, but mostly instruction and design. Um, so um, I guess I'll share my screen. Um, I think it was Ginny or Rachel started like a shared Google folder for all of us um, at this conference. So there's my email, sorry. 
um, which I found really helpful. <laughs> it made me, it made me stay more focused, uh, you know, so thank you for that. And I will try to probably do that more at virtual conferences coming up. Um, but it was um, really, a, it was, the project was called UDL Practices and Information Literacy Courses. Um, so this was about a credit bearing information literacy course where they went over how they applied universal design for learning. Um, so universal design for learning is a guideline, um, you know, or not a guideline, it's a uh, guide. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about the guidelines in a second. But basically it's this idea of that you create multiple means of engagement, representation and action and expression. So engagement um, for purposeful, motivated learners, stimulate interest and motivation for learning. Representation is for resourceful, knowledgeable learners present information and content in different ways. And for strategic goal-directed learners differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. And I feel like what a big core of UDL is that people just, it's about accessibility. It's about making things accessible, but it's about that people learn in a lot of different ways. Um, and so if you provide a variety of ways to represent learning, to engage in learning, to have different action expression in learning, it's always a good thing. Um, so yeah, people are talking about UDL. Um, so that another reason, yeah, Rachel brings up, the only reason I want to talk about UDL a little bit is that their, UDL is um, hot right now. Um, and it's always been hot, but I think particularly with the conversations of how we were quickly shifted online, accessibility, uh, making learning accessible for everyone, um, UDL is having um, a, a big moment. Again, it's always kind of been a big thing, but it's particularly big right now. And again, I find it really easy to connect to. Like I sometimes with different pedagogies, or like instructional design philosophies or theories, I'm kind of like, I don't get it. <laughs> like I don't connect to this, um, but UDL, I really do. So they had specific ways that they went through the UDL guideline, um, which I'll talk about in a second, but they had syllabus suggestions, right? With specific things of what you could do if you have a syllabus um, and how to make it more UDL friendly. And I liked this. Um, so I took a screenshot of it. They also have different modalities. So that's of course an important thing. And then examples of that. So here they have the example of include multiple formats for the same course content search strategies example. And then they had a video on search strategies using Boolean truncation, an infographic showing Boolean connectors and a document or text, a summary of search strategies. Um, so that is um, a great example of how you can have kind of three representations of a concept in that way. And then they had a kind of practical example of what you can do within a course within the LMS. Um, so here's an example of how they did a discussion and kind of with the UDL guidelines. So the UDL guidelines, if you go to um, cast.org, um, UDL, um, and I can drop this in the chat if y'all are interested, or here, you could also probably just Google UDL guidelines and it would take you here. But it's a kind of rubric format that takes you through different concepts, right, of this um, in terms of examples of how to do with engagement. Um, representation and action expression. So it's a really nice tool to look at how you're teaching, how you've designed a website, a resource, and see, are you really thinking through all the different whys, what's, and how's of learning, as they say up here. Um, so, for example, if you're like, I want to check if my tutorials have good um, multimedia for communication, you can just click on the part of the guidelines and then it gives you a specific, you know, a definition of what they mean, and then it gives you examples. So here they're saying compose in multiple media, such as text, speech, drawing, illustration, comics, storyboards, design, film, music, dance, movement, visual arts, sculpture, or video. So of course you don't have to do every single one of those things, but not just relying on one thing in a tutorial is really useful. Um, so the other thing I thought about, and this actually was a while ago now, what is time, but in the summer of last year, ACRL's health science interest group um, did a series of online learning webinars in July. Um, so I did one on, you know, Canvas Studio activity that I do with um, a public health course. Um, that's not why I'm showing this, but they have a lot of great stuff on here that I think would be useful for people to look through. Um, and one of them is this um, slides for quick and easy accessibility tips, which I'm always, I always think that's useful. So you could just link out to that instead of watching the whole hour long webinar. Um, and they give you again, these like slide, you know, transcripts of what's going on um, and what they're saying as well, if you just wanted a quick look. 
Um, so I'll drop that into the chat. But again, they're hour long, but again, especially if you're in ROI and you kind of want a quick intro, this whole one was about PubMed, um, teaching with PubMed, and then also they're like in active learning. So this one is about um, an active flipped pedagogical approach to PubMed, um, which I found really interesting. Um, so again, I'm not, I know not everyone uh, uses PubMed. I know a lot of people in this room do, um, but uh, if you're interested, it's just that. <laughs> So I'm reading the chat. That's it. I'm stop sharing. Thank you, Sam. I did not go to that UDL session because I was like, oh, I already like am pretty familiar with UDL, but yeah, now I had because it sounds like it was a good one. I like any there. That's kind of a thing that's going on right now is I feel like a lot of people who are doing instruction in libraries, like we know what UDL is, we're pretty familiar with UDL, but there's been a couple of good sessions at conferences where they're really using the guidelines in this very like um, uh, constructed way of like going through a course, an information literacy course, or going through a set of tutorials and showing how they like applied the guidelines. Um, so I think that's interesting and a worthwhile thing to think through um, in terms of like your own tutorials as well. Um, I think it, it's not that hard to do to kind of pick a couple and kind of test yourself and, you know, in a, in a low stake kind of assessment way. Um, I'm always looking for that. So I like your idea, Suzanne, of um, interpretive dance to teach info literacy. And I've been thinking about working on that. Um, it came to me as you were reading that out. I was like, dance. How could I do it? Um, all right, awesome. These have been some great share outs. We have time for another one if anybody has anything that they would like to share. I will put in a plug. I am like physically incapable of waiting 30 seconds, just to be clear, um, which is what you're supposed to do. Um, I will put in a plug. I will make this available soon, but um, our ROI intern slash practicum student, Charlie, did an amazing UL VLC session last week um, about study and work during COVID-19 as a, a grad student and library worker. Um, and it was just a very like authentic, refreshing session. I have not put it up on the YouTube uh, channel yet or on the ULVLC guide, but I will soon. So keep an eye out for that because it is, um, I don't, it's, it's one of the best presentations I've seen in a while. It just was really like well done and very relatable. Um, I know several of y'all were there, but it was, it was good stuff. So I will make that available in case you are looking for a, a ULVLC to watch. I thought the Blossom Conference was interesting, guys. Um, there were a lot of good wellness things there. And I had to split my time between that and the Georgia Conference um, that last day. Um, but you know there was some f-bomb fallout later that was very bizarre <laughs> to say the least um you know uh, <laughs> uh but i was appreciative of the candor um that you know particularly some people who work in public libraries um facing some of these things during covid um yeah yeah but it was i thought it was very well done i hope the fallout doesn't mean they will not do it because I think they did it last year for the first time. Um, so um, I saw there was just, I don't know, uh, Katrina had a good session um, that I attended and I saw there was another session about accessibility that I think I got to about half of it that I thought was really interesting because, um, uh, and I actually was listening to a podcast today mentioning this, um, you know, in terms of invisible disabilities and things like that, you know, people don't really think about it until it's their reality. Um, but anybody can become disabled at any time. So that, student, that includes us as library folks and um, our coworkers and our students and, and whatnot. So I know sometimes I don't always think about captioning things and things like that. So I'm trying to um, make sure that's kind of at the forefront. But, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a really good conference. I don't know if anybody else here went. Um. Yeah, I really wanted to go. It sounds like Anne went. Um... And I know Amy went to several things and told me how much she enjoyed those. Um, 
It did. Yeah. It sounded like a really super, Ooh, I like this favorite quote from Blossom, not to be confused with Blossom, the 1990s. There were some people really, really speaking to these issues. Um, I, yeah. yeah it, was, it was really cool. I, I don't know if, if y'all you, if you can get a recording, it would definitely be, you know, worth it. Um, I like the, the one that Anne shared in the chat. My favorite Blossom quote, we don't want a seat at the table. We want to blow the table up. That's very powerful. Um, and Blossom was like a, like a lot about, was it wellness and that kind of? Uh, yeah, it was like wellness with, through like an uh, EDI lens, I, you know. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there was like part of the organization, like they were kind of sponsored by like, was it NIH? It was like the National Institute of Health, I think, was part of their uh, sponsorship. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I said, the K Katrina Kendrick Davis was there. Um, uh, and some fun, like, you know, doing her, the renewal stuff. Um, so, yeah, it was good. Like I said, I didn't get to attend as many sessions as I would have liked. Um, uh, don't you hate when they overlap? But I, I thought it was really, um, you know, I, I like a, a library conference that's, you know, giving you new perspective and showing you some new stuff. Um, so, yeah, it was cool. Um. And I think that's interesting, you know, um, Anti-Racism Daily did a good post today, I think today, about white feminism. And it was in response to Rachel Hollis and uh, her posting a video on Instagram about, and she's a wellness like influencer, which made me think of this um, and how she made a very inappropriate video talking about how people just need to like get it together, you know, <laughs> so like, you know, not really at all like uh, thinking through like systematic uh, oppression. Um, it was, I watched the video. It, it's been taken down, but it bonkers. Um, so um, anyway, uh, that could be an interesting anti, I mean, anti-racism talk uh, to uh, yeah. wellness influencers and, you know, white, in, white feminism and wellness. We talked to, yeah, we talked about this a little bit. It came up at the last anti-racist reading group um, about, uh, Oh, what's her name? Allison Roman, um, basically uh, sort of insulting Marie Kondo and uh, Chrissy Teigen about basically sort of like being sellouts or something. Um, and that, it, when I read that, it, and if you're not, if you're interested in anti-racist work and you're not subscribed to Anti-Racism Daily, it's pretty awesome. I recommend it. Um, it's just a daily email that you get and it usually has some action items. And I feel like um, it's an interesting lens through which to get some news items. But yeah, that one, I don't know anything about Rachel Hollis. That's her name, right? Rachel Hollis. But reading that, um, I guess she like posted a video about how like about having a housekeeper or something and how like she works yeah. hard. Yeah, in the video she that. was like, I've worked hard to have a housekeeper who should just be cleaning my toilet. I mean, it was just really awful. Um, um, and it's an extreme example, but I think again, anti-racism, their newsletter did a good job of breaking it down and being like, though this is an extreme example, like this happens all the time, you know, in the way that uh, white feminism is portrayed. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jenny. Um, but yeah, no, it was, um, it's interesting. Rachel Hollis is also um, very heavily, weirdly involved in um, MLMs and, you know, I mean, you can do research on her multi-level marketing, um, which as some of you know, I think is an interesting <laughs> <laughs> that I sometimes do research on. Um, so. Uh, oh, Rachel. Uh, so um, anyway, it, uh, there, there's a lot about her. Um, I started a video that's an hour and a half this morning on it, all the like junk about Rachel. And I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, let it go. Um, but yeah, she wrote a book called Girl, Wash Your Face. And then- Oh, her, I see that her. book advertised all the time. Yeah, and then her second follow-up was Girl, Stop Apologizing. Yes. And she ironically wrote a huge apology on Instagram after this video and all of her- like they're literally called like Karen followers were like, girl, don't apologize. <laughs> like you were <laughs> like the levels of, you know, uh, yeah. appropriateness just were 
piled on. Sorry, I'm just not talking about Instagram and Rachel Hollis now. No, that's, yeah, no. Well, that was one of the things that came up in that anti-racism daily post was like, they were like, take a look at her apology and compare it to our recommendations for public apologies. Um, and I, I thought that that was really interesting. But yeah, I mean, I didn't even... Uh, it's perfect that you brought that up because I think that's another professional development tool. Um, that daily thing they talk, they've talked about libraries, they talk about organizational culture. Um, they talk again about sort of like news worthy items what's going on. Um, so it is um, great and they have a Patreon if you want to be a patron of theirs and they also you can also do um, like a PayPal, if you want to support them, um, which reminds me, I have seen several um, suggestions online, also speaking of professional development, to the WOC plus lib as a GoFundMe right now. Um, oh, yes, donate, donate. <laughs> yeah, do you, Juanita, do you have a link handy? I don't think I, I sure do. Um, I can hey. pop it in the chat. Um. <laughs> And if you, you don't know, you got to during is, your fundraising drive. You got yeah, to write the clipboard. I, it's been a long right week, there. y'all. It's been such a long week. Uh, hold up. Let's see. Here it is. Uh, it looks like we're going to uh, at least, I mean, probably surpass, but our goal um, is here. Okay. So, yeah, there it is. Um, and so we're going to be working over the summer to... Uh, use these funds to help streamline um, a lot of our workflows and processes, try to, you know, get some merch, um, uh, compensate our very talented team members to some degree. <laughs> yeah, so we have um, a week of uh, themed things going on this week on the Twitter account. So, yeah, yay. <laughs> So. Thank you. Thanks, Juanita. And if you don't know, Juanita is very involved in this project, WOC Plus Live, and I recommend taking a look at it. Um, yeah, the um, the two co-founders met at the residency event about two years ago. So, and we launched two years ago at ACRL. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, one of the co-founders is Lakanda, um, who was a L LAS student here at UNCG. Yep. and was a very briefly uh, an ROI intern. Um, but like many other um, impressive LIS students also had 17 other jobs. <laughs> so was not able to continue doing that, but um, she worked in the TRC. I'm sure people um, would recognize. Yeah, that's where I met her. Um, and now she works at Pro ProQuest. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, it is four o'clock. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing and listening. And um, Sam, yes. Do you have a, oh, well, you were waving. I, I actually find it really delightful that we all still do that. Um, I, a lot of people have been like, oh, I've never waved leaving a meeting, but like, I'm going to now for the rest of my life. Um, we're going to be leaving 216. And I'm going to be like, bye everyone. So <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there we go. We're waving. All right. Thank I, uh, you so much my, for sharing. My new desk, uh, I, I kick my shin against a bar on it all the time and think about 216. Oh, 216. Yeah. Those yeah. Are days. Yeah. All right. Make, make a loud bang right in the middle. And then you'll be like, oh, sorry. Uh, no one's here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I like to also do the rose as I'm leaving my six year old. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just did that. <laughs> Something that Maggie was doing the rose. I call it. Yeah, it's, I, it's very inspirational. My six year old. I should, Maggie, I'm going to send you some pictures of Rose's fashion this week. Yes, please. Fashion. Um, Christmas.